Hello and welcome to Dialogue. To commemorate the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Communist Party of China, CGTN has launched a special series called Centenary and Beyond, where foreign guests were invited on a journey across China to places famous for their roles in the Communist Party's history. As they traveled on this red tour, they reviewed the history of the CPC and talked about the changes that have taken place across this country. And still, the changes are happening today. I'm very delighted to be joined by some of them, and our Tongan, our independent current affairs commentator, Professor Fred Unst of the University of International Business and Economics in Beijing, and Mara Cavolo, CEO of M Communications, and senior fellow at the Center for China and Globalization. That's our topic. I'm Zhou Yun. So I'll start asking uh, the first question why, one by one. Uh, first, you, NR, uh, what's the places you visited and what do you know about those places? <laughs> well, I hadn't, uh, I'd known about some of them beforehand, and yeah. I, um, but I had never actually visited them. Uh, one was in Ningxia. It's uh, called Shihai Gu, and it was literally the poorest place uh, in China. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1972, the UN actually went there and said this was an area that was unfit for habitation and that the people should basically move. Mm -hmm. uh, it was an area where they had sandstorms literally every single day. Um, the people subsisted on potatoes. They had a hundred ways to make potatoes. Very, very little meat in their diet. Uh, absolute uh, poverty. They were able to drill into the mountains to have shelter. But other than that, uh, a really, really, really bare bones existence. Is it better now? It's absolutely better. They, what they did is, um, as part of poverty alleviation, uh, they put in a system. They put in a water system so that they now have wa water. They have running water, which uh, they, they made sure that I knew that they had running water and, and toilets and a sewer and mm. everything like that. Uh, and they literally went in and started turning it on and off mm. and saying, see, we Which have were water. unimaginable in the 1960s. Yeah, unimaginable. And I, I think it's a lot of people watching just don't understand just how uh, you know, basic things were. Uh, at that time. Uh, and then I moved on to the Red Flag um, Canal. And this was a project where 350,000 people were tasked to literally hand dig a canal through mountains. Uh, they had some blasting, some dynamite, and then eventually nitroglycerin. Uh, and they were able to create this incredible canal that brought water into an area once again mm. that had been a much. Now, that represented. That's kind of, also 1960s. In 1960s. And, and now it is a place, it's green, it's verdant. Uh, you see, uh, you know, farms all around and things like that. And it was uh, pretty amazing. It's also uh, become kind of a tourist destination. Mm. My third stop was uh, uh, j just recently. Uh, this was in an area um, just uh, in Hunan, mm. and its claim to fame was this was the place where 18 farmers mm. got together and they decided because they, they had uh, suffered unimaginable hardships, uh, half the village had died uh, due to a previous famine. And they said, look, let's divide the land in a different way. And I suppose we, it's in Anhui then. Anhui, yes. Yeah. And what they did is they, they said that, look, we're going to divide up the land and we will meet our quota. This was not against the government. Uh, they were just trying to find a more efficient way of farming. And they did. Literally in the first year, they produced as much produce as they had in the previous five years. So people started flocking there mm. and trying to understand how they had done this. Okay. And this became a cornerstone of the kind of new socialism mm. that embraced very pragmatically uh, market mechanisms to move China forward. So this was the beginning of black cat, yeah. white cat, doesn't yeah. matter as long as it catches mice. And it kicked off the agricultural reform widespread in China. Yeah, but I mean, more than that, these, were, these are symbols of people who are now working for themselves. Uh, somebody said uh, to me and said, look, 350,000 people for such a small area, 81 people died. I said, well, let's contrast that uh, with the, the railroad in the United States where you had literally 2,000 uh, or 20,000, who knows, because they didn't even care about you know, deciding uh, if a Chinese coolie died. Uh, it wasn't recorded. There, there was no stoppage. They would yeah. just throw them the body away and just uh, continue on. So, you know, that went to benefit a few railroad barons, 
uh, this went to benefit people who are still enjoying the benefits. The mm -hmm. canal is still working. It is still bringing prosperity to the uh, area. So all three represented the kind of determination uh, and organization and collective will, uh, the willingness for everybody to work towards a better future for everybody. Mm. Obviously, you've learned a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Fred, uh, what had the trip yeah. ta 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 taken you, Fred? Well, I've been to uh, Shanghai, the place where the founding Congress of the CPC was taking place, and that's a very historical. Uh, I've never been to that museum before. I think that's a new one. And also went to uh, Yan'an. Uh, Yan'an is where the um, where the uh, Red Star over China is about, mm -hmm. and um, which led uh, to uh, eventually my parents who decided to come to China uh, due to what happened in Yan'an and due to the Red Star over China. Yeah, these two places. Uh, is really worth visiting. As you said, your parents came to yeah. China and first in landed Yan in Yan'an. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Fred, yeah. uh, what, what do you what do you, you found about the places that you visited? Well, um, well, Shanghai. I've been there many times, and um, it's a very um, metropolitan city, very much uh, uh, very similar to a Western city, and not, no big differences. Um, it's always been like that. Uh, Shanghai is uh, the, um, uh, what do you call it, the most modern city throughout Chinese history. Uh -huh. And um, so um, I, well, there's not too much, well, uh, of course, Shanghai expanded uh, tremendously from what I used to uh, remember. Um, but the biggest change is actually taking place in Yan'an. Yeah. Uh, Yan'an used to be a very um, yes. primitive place, like what you said earlier about um, there was a place with the uh, desert storms, with the uh, sand, with no no water. You said, uh, uh, Shanghai, but uh, um, Yan'an is a very poor place. I mean, mm -hmm. Yan'an has um, uh, used to be all lush hill with no hardly any trees, uh, over erosions, and uh, people just lived in caves by digging through this lost soil and living in the caves. The caves actually has the, has the benefits. It's so warm in the winter. Without heating, it's still pretty warm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's cool in the summer. Uh, but uh, uh, when the communists uh, eventually went to Yan'an in 1935-36, it, it was a very uh, poor place. And I visited Yan'an uh, first time in 1962, when I was 10 years old. Uh -huh. um, we went there with well, probably my grandmother came to visit. Wow. And uh, we went to Yan'an and we took a wow. flight um, uh, to, to the to the Yan'an airport. It was just right along the river, a very small airport and uh, very hard anything. I mean, just a few brick buildings. Of course, it was uh, destroyed quite a bit during the war, uh, during the Civil War and during the Japanese and the Japanese war. I think the uh, Japanese airplane threw a lot of bombs. But also the, the nationalists uh, encircled Yan'an and it destroyed a lot of buildings. Um, but Yan'an used to be not yeah. famous for its buildings, but rather famous for a uh, hell site full of uh, caves. You see yeah. one row, another row of caves, another row of caves. The city is built on top of the, 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 the hill site with the caves. And that's what Yan'an was um, in the 40s, 50s, and yeah, to 60s. Exactly. And, Mostly it's the case. Today it's, it's very different. Today, no, I, Yan'an, I cannot, um, it's, it's gone. The old Yan'an is gone. Yeah. It's an, very hard to find the old Yan'an. It's pretty much all high rises. And also the city, uh, the government actually uh, leveled a whole mountain top, uh, building a new city on top of the mountain. And then the new airport is on top of the mountains, no longer on the river bit. Yeah. It has yeah. To, Totally transformed. Exactly. Uh, it used to be all millet uh, agriculture. Now it's mostly um, apple trees, apple trees, and apple trees. And also they discover oil, a lot more oil, uh, gas. So that place is a very prosperous. Exactly. Uh, Yang'an and Shanghai, two places saw a lot of histories uh, in Chinese uh, uh, perspective. Uh, and Mario, what about the places that you've been to? 
Well, coincidentally, Fred, I was just in Yan'an a few days ago. I'd spent some time there as well. What an amazing and beautiful city. But that was on, a, uh, on another project that I can't quite talk about yet. Uh, for this project, I had also gone to Lan Cao. It's a very similar story to what Aner shared. That, you know, back in the late 50s and early 60s, there were a lot of areas. In the case of Lan Cao County, uh, there was natural disasters, and I learned the story. I'd never heard of Lan Cao before, but wow, when I arrived, what a beautiful city, thanks to the efforts of a man who, you know, if we were talking about the Roman Catholics in Italy, this man would have been, would be anointed as a, a canonized a saint, uh, and that is Zhao Yilu. Zhao Yilu literally conquered nature. This man was tasked by the cadres to overcome the disaster, the absolute environmental disasters of sandstorms and soil erosion um, and flooding. He set out with 120 people. They traveled 1,500 kilometers. They, did, they identified the source of the problems. They identified the resources to uh, overcome the problems. And he literally transformed the, the area where we were today Oh, literally, we were there today doing our live at noon. It was a beautiful, beautiful place, all thanks to Zhao Yilu. And secondly, I went back, moving it to the modern side of the story. For the very first time since the pandemic, the other city that I went to was Wuhan. Mm. And I hadn't been there in many, many years. My first time there, I, the first time I was there about 15 years ago, I did a tour of the Budweiser factory, in fact. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's changed quite a bit since then. Yeah, unbelievable. And the purpose of the Wuhan show was to highlight we were at the Architecture, Science, and Technology Museum, and we were there to focus on the remarkable achievement, the resolve, and the sacrifice, and the know-how which we find in the representation of the 10 days within which the Huo Shenshan and Lie Shenshan hospitals mm -hmm. were built. The, the makeshift last hospitals February, to treat March COVID patients early in January last year. Exactly, exactly. So what an incredible feat that was. I was honored to go back there for that. I mean, it, I hadn't been back since that time. Uh, unbelievable story of success and resolve and sacrifice, but again, the most important thing, results. They, the world has to come to understand that the, the government of China, reality is, forget the politics, you know, what's the name of the party? The Communist Party of China, look, they know how to get results. That's what it's about. That's what people are concerned with. And that's what we went there to see in Wuhan. Just amazing. Mm. And NR, uh, I know as an American without any political affiliations with the CPC. How do you look at the CPC's track record? Because obviously we're celebrating its 100th anniversary very soon. Well, I can say that it was completely smooth, but there's been no other uh, party in the world that over 100 years has moved their country out of uh, you know, the domination of colonial powers, <clears throat> uh, literally freed itself, uh, fought back an invading uh, force from Japan and uh, established uh, a new country, which in the last 40 years has uh, created an economic miracle, not only at the, uh, you know, in terms of the you know, GDP and things like that, but eradicating extreme poverty, being able to deal with things like uh, COVID-19, build these hospitals when they need to, to respond to emergencies as it is, to have the collective will to bring people about. So. You know, a lot of people are concerned about what socialism means in the West, and they conflate it with communism. Mm. Communism in China is the basis by which you run the government. It is not, um, you know, what people think. Uh, there are many different views, but once a decision is made, there's discipline. People support the decision made. And that's part of the system because China does, as the other guests have pointed out, a, a, the legitimacy of the party is in their ability to perform. And you just don't see that in a lot of other countries where, you know, if you perform badly, you just simply sit out an election cycle mm. until the other party performs worse than you did. Mm. And then you get yeah. back in.
And Fred, uh, you and your parents are witnesses to the history of the Chinese Communist Party. So do you think the CPC has lived up to its ideals of serving the people? Well, I mean, the ideal changes uh, over time. And uh, before 49, the CPC's ideal is to overthrow imperialism, feudalism, build a new China. And then uh, that's the uh, 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 um, same thing as serving the people. Um, but serving people can be said by many people. Uh, everybody claims to serve the people, but mm -hmm. what they did is overthrow the outside, outside oppression. Then after the founding of New China, um, what is the aim? Was uh, there was a hot debate, and so that characterized the mouse period. And then um, in the 80s and 90s, uh, what characterized is getting a few people rich first, and uh, hopefully eventually everybody get rich. And so eventually, so we do have a lot of people got rich, uh, very rich. You mm. see a lot of very wealthy people in China. But then, what, what is the guiding principle next? Uh, is to rise China up and become a world power, and that's uh, nationalism, that's unifying the party, and is um, so that's what's going on now. No, I, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. I mean, um, world power is just a necessity of trying to feed and move forward. Uh, from one economic level, especially the middle income trap, into the you know, moderate prosperity. Uh, you can't do that without uh, economic uh, activity. And you see this in the Belt and Road and the RCEP. I don't know that I've seen that China says, oh, we're going to be a dominant power, we're going to replace the U.S. as a hegemon, despite everything that's said in the popular <laughs> yeah. press. But, but you have to agree kind of that the, the, the kind of strength kind of gathered by China yeah. has obviously put a lot of people uh, on guard, especially probably Americans, Mario, because the perception of Mar Americans, some Americans, about the CPC uh, has not been so positive. Oh, th their perception of the CPC is a disaster, and, and, and that's a disaster that I'll definitely credit wonderful Western propaganda for, uh, because let's be frank, in the West, you have a society where the billionaires tell the government what to do and the government is running the government for the wealthy and in china the government tells the billionaires what to do and the government is being run for the sake of the entire society not just the wealthy so you have a absolute a diametrically opposed idea a principle of what it is that the government is even supposed to do i have to tell you quickly i checked the constitution of the Communist Party of China, I want to read this to you. <laughs> I did this for Go the show. Ahead. The beginning of the new century marks, yeah, the beginning of the new century marks China's entry into the new stage of development of building a well off society in an all around way. And that is, again, the difference between the West and what has happened here in China. They've built an all-around society. Now, they've got a long way to go, but they haven't forgotten about the society. They're not the society. They're not just building it for the wealthy, are they? And this is an incredibly important point. But I have to, have mm. to add one more final point for me, where all of this really hit home, which was when I realized the root of resolve of the Chinese people and the party and what it was capable of accomplishing when I got asked to play General MacArthur in Kwa Guo Yalu John. I saw that TV Yalu drama. River you played it pretty amazingly, War. by the way, Mario. Thank you, thank you, you brought thank General you very MacArthur much. I appreciate alive. it. But th thank you. I appreciate that part. But my point is. As a child, I only knew that my father served in the Korean War, so I'm not going to say anything bad about America. That nothing is about being anti-American. That's, that's a childish thing to do, to be anti-American or to be anti-Chinese. But I came to understand MacArthur, frankly, he was a maniac. I mean, Truman removed him from office because MacArthur, as I said in the movie, said he wanted to destroy China once and for all. This is absurd and ridiculous. So I realize now how even back then, this was an important route. And this was 70 years ago, 1950, right, where the Chinese rose up, 
as a volunteer army and said, we're not going to put up with this imperialism. And that was a very strong lesson but, for but me Mariel, during this 20 years here in China. A rising power and now a global power as China is, really cares about, and the CPC cares about its prestige internationally and the softer power in the rest of the world. Is there anything that the CPC can do uh, better in terms of communicating its messages to the rest of the world, what would that be? In terms of what they could do better to communicate out to the rest of the world, they have a very tough problem. I don't think that they've addressed it as well as it could be addressed yet, though they're, they're getting there. The problem is, and I know this, because I have a Chinese wife, and that is, you know, Chinese just think differently than the West. So you have wonderful people, for example, like Hua Chunying um, and, and other spokespersons, uh, Wang Yi, and other uh, ambassadors who are representing and messaging out to the international world. But they're still doing it from the Chinese point of view, and so the the bridge the gap is not being filled mm -hmm. well enough yet I, I don't know what the solution is I don't know exactly what the answer is but it's not the gaps not being filled Western communication skills at at messaging still dominate and China's got to figure out a strategy they're not there yet to improve it I'm not quite sure what it is but they're not there yet Fred uh, what, what is your take of course Chinese Communist Party is trying to make its own work better understood by the world and better appreciated. Mm. Now, they, they are busy preaching to the choir, like what he has just, just said. They, they, they're, not, they're not listening to what the other people are saying. They, they're just preaching to the choir. So basically, uh, everybody talking their own way. No, there's. A, I don't see. A, I don't see it. That's a good point. Also, because as China expands, the Chinese economy can grow, grow. They need more resources. They need more markets. Inevitably, a class with the multinationals uh, led by the U.S. That's the uh, that's the nature of capitalism. Nature of um, big uh, conglomerates. And uh, if you want to, if you, uh, the West will be very happy if China just do the straight shop work, making clothes, making shoes making um, assembly the Apple computer parts or iPhone. But if you want to make your own computer, make your own f cell phone, and, and uh, um, uh, uplifting, um, going up on the food chain, going up to the top technology, and uh, uh, inching away, carving away the profit of the Western powers, mm. they will not happen. They will, so I don't see a, a solution. I mean, that is in, inevitable. And you can, you can talk so how to communicate. power and that doesn't change the basic nature. And our, um, the CPC always been saying, framing this, once in a hundred year opportunity for China and the CPC itself. What kind of opportunity is that and what will be the biggest challenges for it? Well, I mean, there, there's a number of goals. I mean, they have to 2035, whether it's uh, environment, uh, this getting past the, um, uh, the middle income trap uh, creating this prosperous society, uh, sustainable uh, mm. society. But I'm going to disagree with my two colleagues. I think there is a very simple uh, answer, and that is that China has the best story over the last four years. If you uh, look at the stories from other countries, they cannot compare over this last 40 years. The U.S. has moved sideways. Uh, Europe is you know, not doing as well. So the developed countries are out of the picture. Even um, the countries that are, are part of this uh, BRICS, they do not measure up. And developing countries, uh, not even there. So China has the best story. They should concentrate mm. on telling its story and not going tit for tat with the uh, American, uh, American or Western press mm. because you, you just, you're playing their game. You're letting them push your buttons. And that is the number one rule of PR. You take control of the message. You do not respond to the message that your opponent is trying to do. Yes, there are ideological, there are economic, and there are cultural differences. But you're not going to mend those by uh, responding, uh, you know, if somebody calls you stupid, you call them stupid. Mm. If they say you started it, you don't say you started it. I mean, that's for the playground. Uh, China is now becoming an adult power and it needs to just kind of not pay attention to the kind of noise that's being created okay. by, uh, in essence, 
uh, governments who are trying to deflect attention from their poor handling, uh, not only of the economic situation, but the health situation. Oh. Mario, uh, what do you think? The middle income trap, the ideological yeah. conflict trap, what are the, tra what are the other, other traps? Uh, he, uh, Anar made a great point. I, I, you know, I started making, I started a quote a few months back. China is the largest safe, stable, successful, and capable country on the planet. Now, if that's your PR message, as long as you can back up a statement like that with a number of key points, then that's what doing what Anar said. You know, it's true. When you go on an interview, you know, we teach and we do media training. When you go on an interview, no matter what the interviewer asks you, your job is to say what you came on the show to say. Right, so you want to stick to your messaging no matter what, not go tit for tat. It's a great point he's making. So when I say China is the largest safe, stable, successful, and capable country on the planet, that's a broad statement. But can it be backed? And I mean easily backed. And the answer is absolutely yes. The story of 40 years of development raising a country up to this level is unprecedented in history. And it was done without massacre, without killing innocent civilians, without starting any wars, without being a bullying imperialist warmonger, which makes it an even more impressive story. So yeah, they need to stick with that amazing story no matter what. It's, it's great advice. And Fred, uh, going down the road, what should the CPC watch out for? Watch out for? Wow, there's a lot of things to watch out for. Um, <laughs> I was going to respond to an yeah. earlier question. Too much. Uh, okay. Too much. Um, well, I mean, you see, all big nations go through cycles. U.S. used to be a colony of England, all right? And then U.S., through a revolution, overthrown British rule, become an independent nation, and eventually become the dominant world power, all right? So now China being become, become a... Uh, like we said, the, the most stable, successful, whatever the uh, government there is in, on the planet, now you have to be concerned about, watch out for big nation chauvinism. Mm. Uh, that is, a, 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 the Chinese is saying, there's a Chinese saying that um, uh, a, a daughter-in-law, uh, after enough time, become the grandmother of the house, so you, be, uh, you, you are being oppressed, and now you are become strong. Will you do the same like others did to you before? Mm -hmm. So that is something China needs to watch out for. And, and what about you, Einar? Uh, Hello? The newfound strength of China is going to be a big accomplishment, but it also can be a challenge. Oh, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> the question that uh, China has to answer to itself is how will it um, be a major power? Will it follow the example of the previous colonial powers? Uh, will it forge a new road? Mm -hmm. Right now, uh, with the RCEP, with a lot of the, the Belt and Road Initiatives, the um, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, you're, you're seeing a side of China that says, look, we, we need resources, we need trade, and we're willing to share it. They see uh, economic activity as the key to making areas stable. But China lacks in a lot of areas. It doesn't know uh, beyond the language. It does not know the cultures even around it, even in, within the Belt and Road Initiative. It doesn't know the U.S. culture as well okay. as it should. All right. Thank you very much, NR. Thank you, Fred. And thank you, Mario, for your insights. Well, obviously, the CPC uh, should be smart enough to know where and how to beat the new path. Thank you for watching our program on CGTN. I'm Zhou in Beijing. Goodbye.